So, what is shamanism? Can an ancient spiritual worldview really help us in our modern lives? Can it help us connect with the earth, with ourselves? I had the great pleasure of speaking with Sandra Ingerman about this and a lot more. I hope you enjoy. My path has been incredibly interesting because I actually grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and um, <laughs> very, very different than what we think about people coming to teach uh, shamanic uh, wisdom. And, but I was always a spiritual child. It's like I, I grew up and, and I, I loved nature. I mean, even though there wasn't that much of it in Brooklyn, I just loved singing to trees and, and talking to the moon and just had a real a destiny of awe and wonder about the earth and talking to all the nature beings and the spirits. And then uh, when I was seven years old, I was hit by lightning and had my first near-death experience. And to be brief, I had two others in my lifetime. And so I would go into these unseen places back to source. And as is true in all shamanic initiations, I would come back changed afterwards with even more inner, I, I kept being drawn within to my own spiritual guidance, but I was really lost because I, I grew up in New York in the 60s, and uh, it was a time when we were all questioning um, what life was about and looking for alternative lifestyles, and so I started searching, uh, mostly working with plant medicine, and then um, I went for my master's in counseling psychology, and I heard about a workshop that might be interesting for me to take. I didn't know what it was, and it was on shamanic journeying. That was on Halloween of 1980, and I had my first formal journey because everything for me was just spiritual information downloading but not knowing what to do with it i had took my first formal journey and i met up with uh what we call a helping spirit and shamanism who started to guide me in my life and what to do with all this spiritual knowledge that was coming through me and how to make a difference in my own life and a difference in the world. And just to say, um, I am a licensed psychotherapist, so uh, my whole work of the 35 years after I got introduced to shamanic journeying has been about how to bridge this incredible ancient universal practice that was practiced everywhere in the world into our culture at this time to help us with our own traumas, to help us grow, to help us evolve, and to help us be positive change makers in service to our great planet. Yeah, thank you. And. Um, it's interesting because when I was talking with uh, a few people, some guests here at the Finthorn Foundation, and they're saying, I'm going to be interviewing Sandra Ingerman. She's a wonderful shaman. Um, uh, one of the responses I got was, well, is it actually appropriate to bring a shamanic practice, which is from a very different culture? Uh, can, you, can you actually sort of trans, transplant that or, or translate it? In, in, um, and is that respectful? Yeah, well, I'll give very brief answers to this. Just a few very important points. First of all, shamanism uh, dates back over 100,000 years. It's the first spiritual practice of humankind. It was practiced everywhere in the world. All of us have shamanic ancestors. Shamanism does not belong to one culture. Um, the, the core practice of shamanism is about direct revelation, that every one of us has uh, the destiny, the right to make their own spiritual connections, to uh, bring in their own insights and to evolve and to heal. And I healed suicidal depression from working with direct revelation, you know, in my own life. And so 
to say I shouldn't be working with helping spirits to heal that part of my life. I don't take from any lineages. I think um, it's wonderful that people are drawn to lineages. And what I uh, tell them is if you're drawn to a lineage, don't take their specific practices and ceremonies. They're not yours. Um, we have to make shamanism our own. Uh, the ceremonies and healing practices, the way that they are practiced in some indigenous cultures, actually can't be translated into our culture because we're dealing with different issues right now. Even shamans in indigenous cultures in Peru and Siberia are saying that they've had, they're changing their songs, their chants, their healing methods, their ceremonies, because the times we're living in are so different. And so I, I have a really good reputation with uh, many indigenous shamans. I, I have never uh, uh, worked with a, a lineage. For me, it's all about in the practice of direct revelation and getting my own spiritual insights. And that is all of our birthright. Um, it's wonderful to have lineages where we can learn the oral stories that were passed down by traditions because we don't have those stories anymore but we have to make our work um, our own because the traumas the issues the changes that we're dealing with indigenous cultures didn't have to deal with them they do now but they they dealt with different issues and so we need to make the work our own yeah I'm actually really struck by one thing you said. You said, um, you know, we each have the ability and actually the duty or the right to sort of tune in, go, go, you could say go within. Um, and that's incredibly similar to how Findhorn began, actually. The early writings have sort of a more Christian sounding flavor to them. But it um, strikes me personally, like we're talking about the same thing in the end. That's really, that's very interesting to hear. Yeah. Um, I've had the opportunity to be at Fintorn a few times. I've taught there a few times. And, um, you know, the spiritual energy and what was created through direct revelation, it, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and I have thousands of students going into hospitals and businesses and schools and working with the homeless and abused uh, children. Uh, and on and on and on in ways that nobody uh, from indigenous cultures would work with. So we all have the destiny to change our own lives, but also to help to be in service to the planet right now. Mm. Yeah. So to return to the shamanic work, um, can you give us a few examples of what a shamanic ceremony might be? Yeah, um, ceremonies, uh, everything in shamanism is actually a ceremony. Everything we do in life is seen as a ceremony. And so in uh, all through, this does not belong to any culture, all of shamanism teaches a very core practice and ceremony is how we get up every morning <clears throat> and approach the day and giving gratitude for the sun for bringing us the life um, that we need to thrive. We don't get uh, energy from electricity, we actually get it from the sun and giving gratitude to the earth and the air and to water and for just gratitude for our life, no matter <clears throat> how big our challenges are. Excuse me, <clears throat> sip of water. And so everything in shamanism was seen as a ceremony, um, working with helping spirits, uh, what we call shamanic journeying was a ceremony, lots of drumming and rattling, preparation work to lift ourselves out of our humanness so that our soul connects and our spirit connects with um, the uh, unseen realms. 
And so in shamanism, there were a lot of ceremonies that were done that started from birth. As soon as you were born, you were welcomed into the world. You were acknowledged for the gift and strength that you were gonna be contributing to the health of the community. So much celebration that a new strength was coming in to help the community. And so ceremonies started at birth and all the rites of passages of every change in life. And think of the rites of passages we go through, just getting a driver's license is an amazing rite of passage. Our life is not the same. So ceremonial work was performed to always honor all those changes that we go through in life, um, all the way up to death, doing ceremonies to bless those who have died, all the living species who leave this planet, saying thank you for sharing your beauty and your gifts, and we wish you a beautiful journey home. That was all done through performing ceremonies, uh, divorce, marriage, um, honoring relationships with the plants, the trees, um, and uh, being able to bring back the soul and the spirit of a place, a community, of a person, all the healing work that was done, you know, was a ceremony, releasing blocks and uh, attitudes and blessing ceremonies, giving thanks for the rain that comes down and the sun that shines. And shamans through their ceremonies and the community performing them together was a way to create harmony between ourselves, everything that's alive in the web of life and the environment around us. Yeah, beautiful. And I'm, it makes me kind of curious. So you have people coming from, um, let's say, city life, and then you start teaching them shamanic work, much like um, I think actually people at Finthorn experience it a lot. We interact with the, the, the consciousness of nature around us. What kind of changes do you see actually happening in people as they begin to incorporate this into their lives? Well, you know, it's, it's really quite amazing because um, I actually teach people in cities that the angels and the David realms and the fairies and the elves and on and on, they're in the cities just like they are in the country. And so I actually teach people how to start to meet uh, those beings and how to start to caretake the earth, even if they're right in the middle of the city. And their life changes when they open up to that magic. And when I teach people, you're walking down the city street and you're focusing on, mm, uh, should I make this change in my life? And all of a sudden a rainbow appears out of the sky. It doesn't matter if you're living in the city or country. Um, the spirits give us omens constantly. It doesn't matter where you live. And so all of a sudden people who live in cities open up to that there are multiple dimensions of life. And that if I start to open up my awareness and, and perceive everything in the invisible around me besides just the tangible, my life is enriched. I enrich in everybody's life who I'm in contact with and I enrich in my community. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and I'm struck by one thing I read in your book, Ceremony, which is you said life kind of has a flow. So in other words, if we reach a certain age, like our bodies are gonna start changing. It's not something we can just sort of ignore or like deny, right? And um, you pointed out the importance of ceremony to mark natural transitions like that. Um, yes. what, do you, what do you think some of the key ones are that we might not actually get around to marking and which shamanic ceremonies could actually really help us to, to harmonize with? Well, I think that everything uh, for me is about flow because what I noticed in my own life is it doesn't matter how many shamanic practices I do unless I move into a particular flow with the unseen realms and the power of the universe. It's like 
I'm, I'm walking on a parallel path that doesn't always merge together. And so um, any change, big change that happens, because whenever we go through any big change in life, we are sculpted into a different being. Our values change, how we perceive ourselves and the world changes. And then our community doesn't always recognize us anymore. And so in shamanic cultures, a ceremony was done to welcome back in the, the changed individual of who you are now and now a different layer that you're co uh, contributing. So whether it's a divorce or healing from uh, an extreme illness or healing from a emotional illness or even changing jobs or um, changing a stage of life, whenever you become different and every change in life is a little death that leads us to a big death so as we're not just connected to nature we are nature when we experience nature death and rebirth are happening every moment uh, throughout the day and that's also happening in our own lives and so ceremony uh, to mark a transition is a way to honor that a death has occurred and a rebirth has now occurred and that we have new opportunities now and new values. It's wonderful, yeah, thank you. Um, another question occurs to me, Sandra. So we work with nature here and I actually have thought for a long time now, like I think we're only like just touching on the potential we have to address issues like climate change, to address issues like um, um, contamination, pollution of the environment and things like that. I mean, my experience here with the Finthorn Gardens has been there, the beings there that inhabit the gardens, they're very eager to engage. Um, so maybe talk about that a little bit. What potential do you see for the future of, work, of using your kind of work to change the environment? Well, uh, a lot of my passion um, since 2000 actually has been to teach people how to work ceremonially to affect um, the environment. And for me, there are two phases of the work. One is we have to change ourselves. We have to become more disciplined with the words that we use. In, in shamanism, words are incantations. So what are we calling in into the world, into the collective with the words that we say to ourselves and the words that we say to others? Our thoughts, um, we've gone too far. There's no way to come back. Where does that train of thought lead us to? How do we change our thoughts to embrace that there's a different opportunity? And then our daydreams and shamanism, it's seen that every single thing that we experience in our life and in the world, we're dreaming into being. And if we look at our daydreams, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to follow the train of where our daydreams are leading us to, because people tend to dream about the worst. So one phase of the work is how we change ourselves. And then the ceremony that I teach, and it's really simple, I can share it right now, is to put on some beautiful spiritual music and go within and experience an inner star or an inner sun or an inner flame growing inside of you because who you are beyond your body and mind and skin is spiritual light and spiritual light heals. And when we get in touch with our starlight, stars, um, they don't effort to shine and they don't focus their light on one part of the world. They just radiate. And all mystical traditions, shamanism in every mystical tradition, speaks to and teaches about when we radiate light, when we become a light-loving presence, 
then that changes everything in our outer world. And so I bring in the feminine principle of how to change our environment that instead we, we want to bridge all the work that we're doing, but we, we want to also be a presence of light because our environment reflects back to us who we are. And we've done all these scientific experiments with polluted water. We did one at, at um, Fintorn. And what we see is that the water or any substance that we pollute actually heals just by us radiating our light, not sending healing, not having the intention of healing, but just being um, light and being a presence of love and light. That, thank you, that's wonderful, yeah. Um, and then I guess the last question I'll ask you is about children, How, bringing children into ceremony. What, what uh, insights do you have around that? Well, you know, children <clears throat> are, are introduced to the um, unseen worlds as soon as they're born, not by elders or people, by their own connections to nature and to the spirits. And so if you ask a child and say, we're going to do a blessing ceremony to bless the land or to let go of our fears, let's do a ceremony to let go of their fears, let's break a stick or um, put a stick into a fire and ask that our fears be released, they will create the most original ceremony. They'll tell you what to wear. They'll bring in the most amazing um, objects. I mean, they love ceremony. And what a gift to our children and to the world to give them that spiritual foundation. And with the work that I was just sharing of being a light in the world, children get that immediately. I just have children dance their starlight and they get it. They get it so quickly. And uh, the unfortunate thing in our culture is because of the media, children are leaving their childhood years too early. They're losing their connection to the unseen realms too early. So by bringing them into a simple ceremony of let's say, let's release our fears and let's break sticks that, um, that we can put our fears into and we break our, I'm just trying to give a, a very short example, or let's dance like a star you start to bring in um, a sense of uh, to children that they do have power in a world that right now seems like it's moving out of control. We start to give them tools to learn how to navigate the changes happening in the world. And that's one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children right now. Hmm. So Sandra, um First of all, I'll just mention it's the book of ceremony. I got the title wrong earlier, sorry about that. And my question is, what is the, what is the bigger context of shamanism? It's an evolutionary journey. We are journeying from, from what to what exactly? Well, it is an evolutionary journey. And what happens in ceremony, ceremonial work, is that the shaman and shamanic practitioners currently around the world um, we step uh, away from our ego and our personality because we're very limited in our perception. Our spirit, our divine, inner divine, has a whole different perception on what's happening in the world. And it's our perception that creates our reality. And so when we perform ceremonial work, the shamanic practitioner actually makes contact with their divine within, lifts out of our humanness, and makes contact with the divine within, which then actually forms this amazing connection with the divine forces of the transcendent realms that we work with. And through that, of putting out our intention of asking for a healthy planet, harmony with all of life, um, to bless our lives and to bless the lives of all species and the planet, 
um, that's how the power of ceremony uh, weaves um, a new fabric of reality in the unseen realms that then is born through us. Everything is born through us and through the power of ceremony, a new fabric of reality is uh, made tangible so that as the fabric of reality of our current life is dissolving right now, we have this incredible new foundation that will hold us as we evolve into our new human selves. Uh, nice, wonderful. Yeah, thanks. That's a, to me, that's a very clear explanation. And uh, where my imagination kind of goes, Sandra, is like, let's say uh, thousands and thousands of people start doing this work. What, how would the world change and what would it look like for us? I personally believe that <clears throat> If every single person, thousands of people in the world, would just get up every morning and give thanks to the earth, air, water, and the sun for all that it gives to us, I believe right there our climate would change. And I know that sounds uh, oversimplified, but the truth of the matter is in shamanism and in life, there's the principle of reciprocity. And when we start to do ceremony to give thanks for our lives, to thanks for nature, all the beings, all the angels, all the helping spirits, that um, energy is returned to us and starts to change our inner world, which changes our outer world. And so I actually believe things can change more quickly than we realize if we would actually do our work, actually do it, make it our own, make it every moment of our life, not just something you do in the morning, but live with a new consciousness, our world will change. So for everyone watching this, one thing I hear people say, I struggle with this myself sometimes, um, I hear you say that our consciousness can change the world. I don't see immediate results. And, you know, I've learned to deal with that. But I, also in the beginning, it's quite hard. So what's one thing that you could say to encourage people who are facing, let's say, you know, well, they're facing the world, they're facing difficult situations all over the place. What is one encouragement you could give them to start, to start now? Well, <clears throat> the, the world right now is in dissolution. Um, and that is part of a shamanic initiation. In every shamanic initiation, which creates change, there's death and dissolution before the remembrance and the illumination. And the rebirth and the illumination part is way beyond what we can perceive on an egoic level. And so um, I, I would like to see a miracle cure myself. Um, I'm right there with everybody. I struggle in the same way. And where I had to come to is we have to understand that when we do spiritual work, it's like cooking an amazing meal. It's not a fast food meal. It's an amazing meal that has its own timing. That's beyond what our ego can embrace. I know how difficult this is. I struggle with it too. And what I share with people is do your practices, let go of the outcome. We might not actually see the results in our lives. But that doesn't mean it doesn't affect our descendants and all of life. And it doesn't mean an invisible world of substance is forming right now that will manifest into the new world we're dreaming about, but in its own timing. So I know it's difficult, but just do the work, do the work, and notice how your perception shifts. And then you start to embrace a bigger picture that what we're dealing with is an organic process and we're not in control of the timing. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. That really um, jives with my own life experience too. 
like getting the conference organized. There was a, a period where it was nothing appeared to be happening. And then all of a sudden this explosion mm -hmm. and everyone now is coming to me and saying, I feel like, you know, this calling to start communicating with the subtle worlds, with the unseen worlds and things like that. Anyway, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before? We no, I, I feel complete. Yeah. I want to thank you, Sandra, for sharing your wisdom and for being such a good friend to this community for many years. Blessings on your work in the world and on all of us in this community, both seen and unseen. If you like this interview, you might want to check out our September conference, Co-Creative Spirituality, and make sure to subscribe to our channel.